Tom Demmer from Dixon, who was the uh, lead Republican on the uh, investigative committee looking into uh, House Speaker Michael Madigan and his role in the uh, ComEd bribery scandal. Uh, I, and I say he was the lead Republican because Democrats shut the committee down. Uh, with with no subpoenas, uh, seemingly little investigation. Um, Representative, first, thanks for the time. Uh, I know you've had a busy 24 hours or so in Springfield. Um, I, I could see the frustration from you all uh, in that committee hearing about about what how Democrats were shutting the the hearings down. Yeah, it was very frustrating. Look, the special investigative committee was formed un, in accordance with House rules. And House rules specifically say the committee shall conduct a thorough investigation. What instead we saw was over the course of 106 days, the committee met just three times and heard from only one witness. I'm not sure that many people would describe that as a thorough investigation. It, it seemed as if Democrats took two, two tracts of, of argument here. One was um, what the speaker if and they wouldn't even say the speaker's name for for the most part or what mike mcclain was doing on behalf of the speaker if the speaker was even involved was just kind of part of the the in and out of springfield the people get recommended for jobs all the time um i i guess first you know it's an easy argument to say mcclain if there was anything nefarious mcclain was working on his own but you know, I've been around government a long time. You've been around government now for 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 what ten years, and it's 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 uh, it's not how things are done, though, right? When you actually see how people operate. Well, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a desire by um, certain uh, Madigan loyalists to portray this as a simple case of making job recommendations, um, but that's uh, that's not what we see in the deferred prosecution agreement. That's not what we've seen in the subsequent indictments of co-conspirators. This goes far beyond a simple job recommendation. And instead, what we see are uh, people who do little or no work um, being given paid positions uh, as subcontractors, um, as, uh, as employees of ComEd, not given those positions because of their merit, but rather given those positions because um, of their political ties and their political connections to Speaker Madigan and his political organization. And so it's, um, I, I think there has been a repeated attempt by some Democratic members to suggest that this was just the Speaker forwarding along a resume from, you know, well-qualified individuals. And instead, what we see are uh, people who do, again, little or no work. They're being recommended for the positions exclusively because of their political connections. And uh, what we see in the email revelations is that if those requests or job recommendations aren't granted, there are threats that uh, if you don't grant this job, he'll come back and ask for more. Uh, if you don't grant this job, there'll be a level of irritation or uh, our friend will go through the drill um, and rectify the, these, these contracts or uh, special perks given to his associates. That clearly is a different scenario than uh, what they'd like you to believe. But when you read Mike McLean's emails, and, and I read the ones that were released right around Thanksgiving, it doesn't seem out of line to allege, at least, at least for Democrats to allege, and this is what the speaker has said all along, was basically that, that McLean was acting on his own and, and using the speaker's name in vain, if, if you will. Is, why, why isn't that a believable idea for you? Well, again, if that's what happened, the speaker should have told us that's what happened. Uh, if that's what happened, we should have called in Mike McLean, uh, Mike Madigan, uh, John Hooker, and Permajor, all these individuals who we sought to call as witnesses. That's our job is to conduct this investigation. And so what we had in the course of our investigation or what limited amount of it that uh, the Democratic chairman allowed to happen is... Commonwealth Edison came in and testified that they took a series of, of actions in order to reward and influence Mike Madigan in his official role as Speaker of the House. That but, but, if, but if you follow the, the McLean emails, though, aren't they trying to influence Durkin too, your leader? No, they testified that that was not the case. Uh, again, they, they testified both in our committee and uh, in 
uh, the deferred prosecution agreement, which was entered into in federal court, that they took certain actions in an attempt to reward and influence public official A. And that's what our committee was, was tasked with, with investigating. That's what they testified to before our committee. And so if there is a defense for that, if the speaker says that that didn't happen, I had no idea this happened, uh, Mike McLean was acting totally without my knowledge or um, uh, without me condoning his actions, why didn't he testify to that before our committee? Why He offered why would... no defense. And so we have, we have undisputed facts offered by Commonwealth Edison, no one on the other side disputing those facts, yet the committee in a um, you know, strong handed way was was shut down prior to hearing from anybody to offer any other side of the story. Why were subpoenas such a big deal here? I mean, theoretically, if you're under indictment from the federal government, like like McLean, Promaggio or Hooker, et cetera, the 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 group from ComEd. Uh, and we should point out that the speaker isn't under indictment, um, at least not yet. Um, the aren't they going to take the fifth anyway? So so I mean, why? What what was the whole point of the the act? If you know they're not going to get up and say anything, oh, we don't know that they're not going to say anything. Um, we've had, I mean, look, Fidel Marquez pled guilty uh, in federal court, so you're not going to plead the fifth after you pled guilty. Um, the others have entered gu not guilty pleas for now. Several others have not been indicted, and so you know we we'd be interested in hearing from them as well. In addition to that, Speaker Madigan had stated that he was not exercising his Fifth Amendment right. And so uh, under what basis would he have not answered questions from the committee? Uh, the, the, I think the, uh, the reality is, just as it was in the previous case where former Representative Smith was brought before a special investigative committee, the committee stated that they, they could reasonably infer that the reason that he didn't appear before the committee is because he could not truthfully deny the allegations under oath. And I think that was a big uh, component here is that if you appear before the committee, uh, you're offering your testimony under oath. And the speaker um, seems to have an aversion to testifying under oath about his actions and involvement here. Well, the, you bring up the Derek Smith issue from, I think that was 2012, um, you know, and then there was Luis, Luis Arroyo last year that never even got to a hearing before he was, before he resigned. The difference in those hearings or those petitions, I suppose, is probably the right word, since Arroyo didn't go to a hearing, was that they were indicted. They were under indictment by the federal government when that petition was filed. Again, you know, here in here in the land of, of you know, fair trials and such, the, the speaker has not been indicted of anything. And there's, there's, there's reasonable belief that he's innocent until proven guilty. So, so in a you know, in a situation like that, do you believe he has the, you know, the obligation to to speak to you when when clearly there is a partisan part of this? Well, first, let's look at a couple of things. Um, we are not conducting a criminal investigation. We're conducting an investigation under the terms of the of the rules of the House of Representatives, um, and our only ability uh, is to discipline a member of the House of Representatives in relation to their conduct as an elected official. So there's a different standard that you bring. It's not simply a criminal conviction. I'd also point out that in the Derek Smith case, the proceedings and with uh, former Representative Arroyo as well, the proceedings were begun when they were indicted, but they weren't convicted yet. They, they still had the same presumption of innocence um, that you know, bring, being brought on charges is different than being convicted of those charges. And so they still were entitled to, and they received in their criminal proceedings, all those same presumptions of innocence and the innocent until proven guilty. Um, and that did not stop the house from saying, look, uh, aside from their, their criminal proceedings, there are severe and uh, in the house of representatives. The second thing I'd say is that um, in those cases, as they were just brought on charges, not yet convicted, there's also a difference in the charges that uh, we're considering today in that it's not just that Commonwealth Edison has been brought up on charges or that Fidel Marquez has been brought up on charges. ComEd admitted to that behavior uh, in order to avoid prosecution. So entered essentially into a plea deal, just like Fidel Marquez entered into uh, entered a guilty plea as part of a, a plea bargain. 
So these are not uh, allegations uh, in, in relation to ComEd and, and to put Del Marquez, these are admitted facts. And so it's, it's certainly not a, uh, not a leap for the House of Representatives to say, we've had two very, very significant admissions in federal court, um, not just allegations, but admissions, and they all revolve around public official A, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the House really has no choice but to investigate a member who's tied up in a scheme like that. So uh, I'm trying not to sound too partisan with this question, but it it doesn't take a super trained eye to watch the way the Democrats orchestrated the end of that committee uh, yesterday as we're, as we're talking on Tuesday. Um, with with voting against their own broad motion for subpoenas, uh, which didn't mention any actual people to subpoena, uh, you know, Lisa Hernandez made the motion, then voted against it, and then you know quickly lining up the the votes for for rejection of the charge and and ending the committee. I, I guess one, it it doesn't take a lot to look at that and say, this was clearly orchestrated as a way to let the speaker off the hook. Um, but the way that they argue it is that they were trying to put, to put to bed what they felt was a political persecution that Republicans were putting on. Um, you know, reasonable people, I suppose, can have their own, their own differences on that. But, but it was obvious that, that it was an orchestrated close, right? It was an orchestrated close by the Democrats yesterday, uh, certainly. Um, I mean, it's, it's a rare circumstance where you see a member make a motion and then vote against their own motion. That happened a couple of occasions yesterday. Um, in addition, the, the argument that this was a, just a political stunt, uh, I think that myth is dispelled uh, every time we see a, an additional member of the Democratic Party uh, talk about how the uh, circumstances surrounding Mike Madigan make it impossible for him to continue to serve as Speaker of the House or as Chairman of the Democratic Party. Uh, it's, that myth is belied uh, when we see Governor Pritzker say that the Speaker needs to answer questions and that he should appear before the committee and answer those questions. He specifically said the, uh, the Speaker Megan should appear before the Special Investigative Committee and answer our questions. Um, this committee, uh, it's, it's easy, I think, for the three Democrats on the panel to say this is a political stunt. Uh, but I think if they listen to some of their Democratic colleagues uh, from positions of authority all across the state, uh, they would see that that's simply not the case. Before I let you go, Representative, there's a lot going on right now. I mean, the COGFA put the budget deficit at $4 billion um, that we're currently in, um, even though the governor is going to add, theoretically cut that in half with $2 billion in borrowing. And and, and COGFA has a new report out that shows the pension unfunded liability is up to 144 billion, not to mention unemployment insurance, not to mention people who are having a hard time putting food on the table. Are, are fights like this, which, which, you know, and people have their mind made up on the speaker one way or another, I think out there, at least those who are, are tuned into politics. But our, our political fights where, you know, you guys are calling each other names, you know, one of your members called the chairman a coward, he, he had plenty of, of, of choice words for you all yesterday. The, was this a distraction from the real, the real serious issues in, impacting people today? Look, if this was a question simply of who is going to be the chairman of the Democratic Party of Illinois, you could make an argument that says this is not the time or place to, to be having this discussion. Instead, we're talking about the leader of one house of the legislature. And as you outline these very severe and significant challenges that we're facing as a state today, uh, it needs to be crystal clear to the people of Illinois that we're not going to tolerate the kind of leadership in the house that is uh, consistently under a uh, cloud of scandal related to their behavior uh, in their official office. If we're going to be able to move forward and address some of those challenges, we need to have a Speaker of the House who's not the center of a federal criminal investigation. We need to have a Speaker of the House who was not uh, involved in uh, getting no-show jobs and special contracts 
uh, in relation to whether or not certain legislation would be considered before the House. We need to move past that, uh, elect a new Speaker of the House, and have the begin the work of restoring people's confidence that the House of Representatives is actually representative of the people of the state of Illinois. Representative Tom Demmer from Dixon. Uh, Representative, thanks so much for the time. Uh, I know you've had a busy couple of days. Good luck on your uh, drive back to Dixon and have a great holidays. Thank you. You too, Patrick.